ladies and gentlemen, we now segue transition to <coughs> uh, retired Colonel Abbas Dahouk. Uh, Colonel Dahouk uh, has his own consulting and advisory firm and uh, providing counsel and guidance to Americans uh, seeking to pursue uh, their business opportunities in the Arab region, the Middle East, and the Islamic world. Uh, how much uh, better position could one be to provide such services than uh, Colonel uh, Dahouk? Uh, he was the U.S. Army and all services defense attache in the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh uh, before returning to the United States and serving in the Department of State uh, in the area providing advice on uh, military security, military science, and the relationships between the political side of the U.S. government here and abroad and the military side. So he served both in the Pentagon and the Department of State and in the field. He was born and raised in Lebanon. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Arizona, uh, but continued his study in Oman, where he received a bachelor's uh, degree there from Oman's Joint Military Command and Staff uh, College. He also has his degree and master's degree uh, from Princeton University. Uh, we shared two or three uh, experiences in the sense that we both enlisted in the uh, armed forces when we were teenagers. Uh, we did not know each other at the time, but he continued uh, to become a non-commissioned officer and then to go to officer's candidate school and become a full-fledged uh, officer. Yeah, he's also served at the U.S. Army War College at Carlisle Barracks in uh, uh, Pennsylvania and has been a co-escort of delegations of young people from the military academies of West Point, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, the Citadel, and the Virginia Military Institute, my alma mater, uh, bringing them to the Arab region and to establish relationships between budding, young, new, uh, blossoming, blooming uh, uh, American um, armed forces officers uh, of the future. We've done this together. We've done it in Saudi Arabia and, and in Qatar, as well as the United Arab Emirates. And we work together on matters pertaining to the Sultanate of Oman, which has been the principal leader in these kinds of, of exchanges, unbeknownst to many Americans. Uh, but we also uh, both went to Princeton. Uh, he to further his Near East studies uh, education, myself to do that, plus work on improving my Arabic uh, as an outstanding member of the National Council's Board of Directors. He brings a unique experience, background, perspective, and distinctly different from other board members. We're lucky to have him. Thank you, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Anthony, and uh, good day and hello to uh, all our viewers near and far. I'm uh, Abbas Dahouk, and uh, honored to be with you and with our esteemed and distinguished uh, panel of experts on defense cooperation and Middle East affairs. As uh, Dr. Anthony uh, mentioned, that I'm a board member of the council, and on uh, his behalf, uh, on behalf of Dr. John Duke Anthony, my fellow board, board members, and fantastic staff, I welcome all of you today. And I also invite the viewers as we go along to send us questions by email. You will see the email uh, address posted frequently on the screen. So our task at hand uh, today for this session is to discuss U.S. Arab uh, defense cooperation dynamics. With that, and before I introduce the speakers, let me take us, uh, let me set the stage uh, by uh, uh, regional stage by taking us back in history to President Carter's uh, State of the Union Address on 23rd January, 1980, when he said, let our position be absolutely clear. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region 
will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest of the United States of America. And such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including uh, military force. So this, this union address was specifically directed against Iran and the Soviet Union, Russia today. So almost 41 years later, much shedding of U.S. blood and treasure in the Middle East region, Iran and Russia are back on the scene again, countering U.S. and Arab countries' interest directly and committing boots on the ground. Russia is already in Syria. It's in Iraq. It's on the western borders uh, in Egypt. And it's also flirting with uh, our NATO ally, Turkey. Iran, as we all know, it's in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and Yemen. Additionally, China, another major U.S. foe, is not far behind. If that's not uh, a grim uh, uh, a picture, uh, I would like to uh, 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 mention uh, there are comments uh, yesterday from His Royal Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal, Al Faisal, when he described the status of the Middle East as a troubled region in a state of strategic confusion. Those are disturbing uh, dynamics, and those are current dynamics. So what went wrong? And how could the US, EU countries, regional allies and friends write it now? I don't know, how do we make it right? On this note, please allow me to uh, welcome our first uh, speaker, um, so, uh, Kristen Fountain Rose. Uh, she is a director at the Atlantic Council, where she leads the security pillar within the Middle East programs. She has over 20 years of experience working with the national security apparatuses of nations in the Middle East and Africa, from positions within the United States uh, Department of Defense, uh, Department of State, the White House, private industry, and nonprofit sector. Kirsten, please uh, welcome, Kirsten, and please let, lend us your uh, views and thoughts on the current U.S. defense cooperation dynamics in the region. region. And if you will, please address how you the new administration gauge the current situation and what changes, if any, you foresee in the, its defense policy. The floor of yours. Thank you so much, Abbas. It's wonderful to be back with the National Council and I'm happy to address this question. Let's start with, uh, with what we know about a Biden administration's priorities in the Middle East. His advisors have stated very clearly that they will be the following four. First is containing Iran's nuclear program and its activities that destabilize the region. Second is securing Israel and advancing Arab-Israeli peace. Third is ending the wars in Yemen and Libya. And the fourth is advancing human rights. So let's dive a little bit deeper into what we can expect. What aspects of US policy toward the Middle East will remain relatively unchanged with regard to defense cooperation and what will be notably different? Let's start with what will remain in place. There will be a continued emphasis on burden sharing to quote a close friend of uh, Biden's recently, Vice President Biden is not contemplating withdrawing US troops, but he is contemplating ending wars. This will mean leaning heavily on countries in the region to be the brokers of peace, to make compromises, to provide incentives to adversaries for ending conflicts. We will also see continued pressure on Arab partners to downgrade relationships with Russia and China in the areas of defense and security, cyber, artificial intelligence and big data, and nuclear energy. There will be a continued emphasis on counterterrorism, as General McKinsey alluded to. If the attacks against French citizens and interests in the past weeks are any indication of the immediate future of violent extremism, we should expect a resurgence of attacks against civilians. The US under Biden will seek greater alignment with our transatlantic partners, and this will include on CT. So you can look a bit to some European policies for hints. Now let's take a look at how US policy in the Middle East will differ with regard to defense cooperation. There will be an end to the US involvement in Yemen. A Biden administration will cut off sales of smart bombs to the coalition and put the small US team, pull the small US team from the cell that works to prevent Saudi airstrikes from hitting civilians. The motive is to end the US role in a war that has worsened an already grave humanitarian crisis. Unfortunately, Ending the very limited US support will not end the war. Only a political solution will end the war. 
The Biden team will work hard to arrive at one if it has not already been reached by February. But this leads us to another difference. Arms sales will be curtailed under Biden, and this is related to the war in Yemen. Biden will be pulled in two different directions on arms sales. The left side of the Democratic Party seeks an end to all arms sales. This not only impacts the Middle East, but also partners like Japan and Taiwan. But Biden understands that it does not make sense during an economic downturn to cripple an American industry in which seven of the top 10 producers worldwide are American. He will, however, end sales of smart bombs to Saudi Arabia as they are used to conduct strikes in Yemen. But again, ending the US sales will not end the war. Until a political solution is reached for Yemen, Saudi Arabia can simply buy bombs from China to replace those withheld by the US. When US smart bombs are replaced with Chinese dumb bombs and Saudi airstrikes, civilian casualties will rise. Will that make the US less responsible for deaths in Yemen or more? Yesterday, Senator Menendez placed four JRDs, Joint Resolutions of Disapproval, on the arms sales to the UAE to include the F-35. This is one JRD for every notification of sales submitted to Congress by the Foreign Military Sales Oversight Team at the State Department. But this is not solely a statement on a congressional posture toward the UAE. This is also just American politics. These four separate disapprovals will force Congress to deal with each individually on the floor of Congress. This means if the Republicans want to push through the sales to the UAE before the end of the administration, they will have to use congressional session time that Mitch McConnell would prefer to use to confirm additional conservative judges to place in courts around America. So there is as much domestic politics involved as there is foreign policy. Biden will also place a greater emphasis on multilateral organizations over bilateral relations. And here is where the region tragically shot itself in the foot. Mesa, the Middle East Strategic Alliance was one of the only multilateral approaches to foreign policy supported by the Trump administration. It sought to create a block of Arab countries that would collaborate and cooperate on regional security, intra-regional energy networks to increase regional self-sufficiency and regional economic growth and resiliency. It was not presented as a fait accompli by the US. The region was invited to shape it from the ground up. It was a complete win-win. A year into the process and without first consulting the US, two Gulf countries threw out that concept and attempted to replace it with a security only agreement. So when the new concept they proposed was put in front of the committee of US senior leaders for approval, the answer was no, that isn't what they had originally agreed to and they didn't like the security only focus. Now with the Biden administration, there will be a continued support for establishing a new regional security architecture. And there is support for a multilateral regional security platform using some uh, among some members of Congress. It's also uh, supported at the EU and in the top levels of the UN. But this, this new vision for such architecture includes Turkey, Israel, and even Iran in some cases. The region missed out on its opportunity to be the sole interest at the table with the US, and it will not receive an offer like this again in the foreseeable future. So what actions can our countries take to move the region ahead in the coming four years in terms of defense and security? For policymakers in the US and Europe, I have one concrete recommendation, and this is work together on a multilateral mechanism for resolving conflicts in the Middle East. This was one component of MESA and it remains important. Apply lessons learned from Europe's experience with the OSCE perhaps. Experiment with making the circle of invitation narrow or wide. Maybe everyone gets a vote. As another experiment, and I do say this to be provocative, revoke the vote on any particular issue from any country involved physically or materially in the conflict issue at hand. See how that impacts foreign interventions. Have fun. In closing, I have one recommendation for the region. As evidenced by the US elections, the American people are not assured of the value of America's global relationships right now. They question our involvement with the UN, our funding for NATO, and our military presence in the Middle East. The US government will do its best to explain the value in these and the value of our partnerships and the value of our security cooperation arrangements and relationships but the region really should do its part to convince the American people as well. Americans need to see how their lives are made better by sending their sons and daughters to live on bases or compounds in the Middle East. This should be a topic of discussion in foreign ministries and outreach programs to the heart of America should be the result. The Biden administration will be focused on domestic challenges first. So they will need your help, the region's help in making the case to Americans. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kirsten. That was a um, uh, very uh, um, interesting, uh, fantastic, and insightful uh, remarks. Uh, perhaps we'll get some, uh, from the audience uh, questions on uh, on Yemen more uh, dive uh, dive into a bit, and also on the uh, on the new Mesa. That's very uh, interesting uh, construct. Um, now I'll move to our uh, uh, second speaker for uh, her remark. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Cynthia Bianco. She is the uh, Gulf Research Fellow at the European Council on Foreign uh, Relations. She's based in Berlin, where she's uh, working on political security and economic developments in the Arabian Peninsula and Gulf region and relations uh, with, uh, with Europe. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Bianco. I uh, also uh, uh, ask you to lend us uh, your views and thoughts as well on the current uh, uh, security, uh, security dynamics in the, in the region uh, from uh, EU uh, Council and EU countries' uh, perspective. And, and if you will, how, how do the EU countries view their political military interests uh, uh, there as well? For Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and a uh, very interesting and thought provoking um, discussion so far. So mm -hmm. let me take a few minutes to uh, basically give you a diff diff the different inputs of the conversation that uh, is currently going on in Europe. And first and foremost, um, we should start by saying that uh, the four years of the presidency of Donald Trump have worked um, sort of as a wake up call to many European capitals in the sense that uh, certainly uh, in many European capitals, uh, the Trump presidency still is perceived as, um, uh, as, as, as a moment rather than as a process. However, um, they, the issues that have been raised in terms of uh, challenges to transatlantic cooperation, particularly on uh, security matters, have been internalized uh, uh, by some, and there, there's been, as a result, a debate triggered. Uh, the debate that, you know, in Europe uh, goes by the name of strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty. What does that mean? Um, they are two slightly different concepts, but basically we're still talking about uh, the ability of European countries to cooperate in a way that they can uh, preserve the, the minimum, the core interests, their, their own core interests uh, in security without relying excessively on the United States. And uh, this has been true uh, across the board if we look at the different regions, but it's been particularly true if we look at the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, what happened since 2011 has had really strong repercussions uh, on uh, Europe. And as, as Kirsten was, uh, was mentioning before, still to this day, uh, there are, for instance, sporadic uh, um, events of uh, terrorism and radicalism against European interests and against European uh, people. The fact that no European countries, and of course, uh, uh, neither the EU, had any significant security leverage on regional players, uh, state and non-state, um, that could be really used to uh, uh, mold uh, and, and, and take uh, sort of better control of, uh, of uh, the negative repercussions of uh, strategic change and political change and geopolitical rivalry has really, really hit back uh, in Europe. However, um, this is a very difficult conversation to have, and it becomes even more difficult when we shift the focus to the Gulf specifically. Uh, whereas the European countries uh, have had long, for four decades, a special interests in the Mediterranean, they have been very marginal uh, in the Gulf. Um, and that was also because their most important uh, uh, partner, the United States, was the unipolar uh, force in the Gulf, uh, wanted to be so, uh, especially you, you quoted Abbas, uh, um, President Carter, of course, and, and therefore, the, and the Europeans were sort of, uh, uh, didn't mind to not be as involved geopolitically and in security uh, and in defense matters in the Gulf in particular. 
So it becomes very complicated uh, then to add, to shift the focus and, and talk about strategic autonomy or strategic uh, so sovereignty uh, when you look at foreign and security policy, and in particular in an area such as the Gulf. At the same time, there is a growing realization in Europe that the rivalries that are at the core of uh, many different conflicts in the region originate from the Gulf, in particular, the one between Saudi Arabia and Iran and the one between the United Arab Emirates and Turkey. And these have extended their borders so widely that they have hit very close to home in the Eastern Mediterranean as of a few months ago. So uh, there is this sense of urgency. There is the debate ongoing. There are, however, obstacles, uh, obstacles that come from a, a lack of, uh, uh, for, for instance, of complete agreement in the different European capitals about how should this sovereign, uh, strategic sovereignty look like um, how should it be uh, agreed with the new Biden administration? Will they be fully on board and support um, a, a, a stronger uh, European coordination that might, uh, in some cases, not be exactly on the same page as uh, uh, the Biden administration? Of course, uh, largely speaking, there is a remarkable convergence between Europe and the US. However, at the same time, uh, there are issues that are crucial for Europe um, where the, the views do differ uh, from the ones in Washington. In particular, I'm referring to uh, Iran, which is the only dossier, Gulf-specific dossier, that Europeans have pursued, both at the level of European countries and at the level of the European Union. And here, let me add another layer of uh, a different angle, perhaps. As you know, the European Union, per se, does not have a military capability. Um, it has a very limited uh, um, agreements and it's working on strengthening um, joint missions that are uh, discussed uh, and uh, approved and dispatched directly from the EU, but it, that's still uh, uh, very much in the beginning. Um, and on many of where there is, there is a lot of uh, uh, political divergences and controversies within the EU, it's particularly difficult to agree on a foreign and security policy mission uh, on between 27 different countries. Um, the Gulf is, is one of those hot issues, in particular when we look at uh, security and, and military. And so, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, maritime security mission, EMASO, which is a French-led security mission, is not an EU mission. It's a mission that has been um, established by a core group of European countries. And it is very likely that we will see uh, other initiatives uh, uh, similar to those uh, in the immediate future, uh, as long as the conversation and, and, and the debate uh, about strategic sovereignty and strategic autonomy continues and, and an agreement is found, uh, which again is, is really, is really uh, challenging if you think of the, of the sheer size of the political negotiations. We're talking 27 different countries. So we're going to see possibly other initiatives that are brought forward by uh, uh, smaller groups of European countries where uh, there could be a, a greater or smaller level of coordination with the EU. Um, and the hope um, from a policy recommendation point of view is that a Biden administration would take stock of this multi-layered situation in Europe and encourage the process keeping in mind all of the challenges and the obstacles, the process towards uh, uh, furthering uh, the, the independence uh, or the autonomy uh, of uh, the, the, the Europeans in a way that really uh, creates a division of labor in the Middle East. And that could work to the benefit of the American people and the Europeans and the, 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 the individual governments, given that we all have uh, domestic challenges to confront, that we're all talking about ending the endless wars, uh, and that uh, no one is really looking forward to be up in front and trying to uh, um, dis districate all of the different uh, 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 geopolitical uh, um, conflicts uh, throughout the region. So in, in all of these sort of framework, um, we then uh, have to add the element of the uh, more specific defense partnerships. 
And in this, I would, I would say that um, the Europeans play, of course, a minor role compared to the US in defense sales to the Gulf, but that is, has been uh, growing. And we have seen, uh, uh, we still see a significant interest in France, in the United Kingdom, uh, in, even in Italy to uh, double down on existing uh, uh, deals and partnerships and uh, uh, really to the benefit of the defense, uh, the defense industries. However, so far, um, I have to say that it has been a different sort of approach, uh, again, uh, in different countries. Um, we have a country like Germany, for instance, who has banned uh, uh, export uh, of defense material to Saudi Arabia as long as the kingdom is involved in the war in Yemen. And then we have other countries like, uh, such as France and the United Kingdom, who instead have had a more, more ambivalent approach. Um, this is likely to continue because not all European capitals necessarily see defense uh, sales as an integral part of security policies and, uh, um, and their geopolitical projection, which is already sort of a work in progress. Um, on that hand, uh, I think it's, it would be beneficial if uh, the Biden administration, who instead, as Kirsten explained, has a different perspective, um, given a different role, would try to bridge also that conversation uh, more uh, with their transatlantic partners. In a nutshell, and to conclude, uh, we, I think, are in bad need of renewing the transatlantic cooperation and have, having a very pragmatic, flexible, forward-looking approach um, and try to uh, create a division of labor that could advance uh, positive solutions for the region and in the same time, uh, the, the same time create that burden sharing um, that alleviates uh, uh, the responsibilities and the commitments of the different parties. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you, Dr. Bianco, very much. Uh, uh, again, insightful uh, comments. Uh, uh, I agree that um, and, uh, uh, Biden administration needs to work closely with uh, Europe on uh, many, uh, many topics. I mean, immediate topics is, will be uh, uh, Libya, Syria, perhaps uh, uh, Yemen, and, and the uh, arms trade as well. So on this note, I will transition to our uh, uh, next speaker, Dr. Anthony Portsman, uh, no need uh, introduction, but he is uh, he's the Arnie Burke Chair in Strategy at Center of Strategic and International Studies. He has led many studies on national missile defense, uh, asymmetric warfare, and weapons of mass destruction, and critical infrastructure protection. He's the author of more than 50 books, including four volume series on the lessons of modern war. Dr. Grossman, uh, you have written volumes on literature on defense uh, corporations and arms uh, sales. Uh, we are and I am also interested in hearing your views on the uh, uh, security cooperation dynamics and how well do arms sales address the kind of security challenges that currently exist in the region, particularly when it comes to confronting Iran which uh, tends to rely on more asymmetric means of uh, power projection. Uh, Dr. Korsman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm going to take probably the most negative approach to security in this region that will occur during this conference. I think I've been at it too long to have much belief that we're going to have quick or easy solutions. I think any politician or figure that talks about an end to the long wars is living in a fantasy land. The tensions in this region, the problems in this region would take a minimum of a decade to resolve. And right now we're not doing a particularly positive or a good job of it. If we look at the region, we have to look at cases. We also have to realize we're talking really about three different subregions. One are the Arab states in the Mediterranean, another are the ones largely in the Levant, and the third is in the Gulf. All of these states have to face the fact the nature of warfare is changing very sharply. We're talking about multi domain conflicts, hybrid warfare, gray area operations words we didn't even use five or 10 years ago with any serious focus. 
But every country that has an arms buy has to consider these changes or should. And so far, when you actually look at detailed buys, time and again, it becomes remarkably difficult to figure out why the country is doing this, why it's spending this kind of money, and how they intend to actually integrate it with other countries and create an effective force structure. Let's begin with the Mediterranean. And I think in fairness, Morocco and Tunisia are not problems. But when it comes to the rest of the countries, we have Algeria, which is an army with a country, still making very large arms purchases, most of which have no clear relation to a definable threat. Still relatively repressive in spite of elements of reform and which has a much higher priority for development than it does for military spending in arms sales. Now, I'm willing to bet a whole dollar that the military junta survives the current wave of reforms. It's done it in the past and I think it will do it in the future. In Libya, we have a hopelessly divided mess with a wide range of outside countries talking about ceasefires, conducting covert operations, major arms deliveries and sorties. Now in the case of Russia, providing mercenaries, which is an interesting new step. And what does a ceasefire, if one happens, actually produce by way of stability and development and integrated government. In the case of Egypt, we have a second army with a country rather than a country with an army. If we look honestly at what's happening, they have demonstrated they can turn to France and Russia if we restrict arms sales or interfere with the aid process. But when you look at what they're buying, you have to ask quite frankly, why are you doing this? Who is the threat? Why are you layering modernization over the retention of past forces? Compared to the need for development, is this the way to spend money in the region? I think they have had a reasonable amount of advice I don't think they have taken it. And our elements of this process of internal security, too repressive, yes, they are. They limit the lo level of local and internal criticism that Egypt needs. And somewhere throughout this region, Turkey is creating its own messes in the Mediterranean, whether we want to make it part of the Middle East or not. If we turn to the Levant, I don't think it's really at this point useful to comment on Egypt's military forces. The problem I think the Biden administration will face is what do you do about the Palestinians in Gaza and what do you do about the Palestinians on the West Bank? If you don't have two states, how do you create some kind of working viable relationship? In terms of its military priorities, there's very little I can suggest to Israel. But as we move north and look at Lebanon, which actually has some relatively effective internal military forces, we see a major buildup of a missile threat with precision strike capabilities, with no clear controls, which potentially can be used against Israel and where there seems to be a virtual indifference on the part of the people arming and taking those arms about putting those missile weapons into highly populated areas and Israel's threats to conduct not a land invasion the next time, but a strategic bombing campaign designed to cripple at least the Shiite areas of Lebanon. We look at Iraq, and here I have to feel at least 
that General McKenzie was far too optimistic about what the US has done. So far, the more we come under pressure, the faster we leave. And the issue isn't just troop levels, it's military facilities, it's embassy personnel, it is putting people forward that can support the best combat units inside Iraq. It is creating some kind of balance and incentive that deals with Iraq's economic problems and crisis that give it an incentive to continue to work with the United States and deal with the creation of military forces that can act as a deterrent and not simply an anti-terrorism force. I don't know what you say about Syria. You have state terrorism where you have killed far more people from the Assad regime than every extremist movement in the world has killed since 2012. The casualty figures are relatively public. They're appalling. And what happens? What's going to happen in the East to the enclave we supported? I've not heard anybody say a thing about what we're going to do. What happens with Turkey and Idlib? What on earth emerges in terms of a Russian, Iranian, and Hezbollah presence? Consider where we were in 2012 and consider where we are now. The Gulf Cooperation Council, I think, is a critical institution. But let's be blunt. We have had presidents which have focused far too much on burden sharing, taken an erratic status in dealing with Iraq, have not really developed clear plans for how CENTCOM will work with countries in the future. And we also have a Game of Thrones by three sets of princes in Qatar, in the UAE and Saudi Arabia, which is remarkably destructive. We do not have progress in dealing with interoperability, the integration of battle management, communications, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets. We have massive buys of modern aircraft. If any of you read the details of the UAE's request for the F-35 program, it would probably create the most effective two squadron air force in the world. Two squadrons is two squadrons. Four, if they can afford to upgrade the F-16s. But the life cycle cost of those purchases is probably going to be about twice the cost over time of their past aircraft buys. The Sparta of the Gulf doesn't seem to have an effective Navy. It seems to have about one brigade of an army. It hasn't demonstrated it can coordinate even with Saudi Arabia. And as we heard earlier, we are talking about canceling the efforts that do allow some kind of targeting that restricts attacks and civilian casualties. When it comes down to burden sharing here, the US frankly needs a great deal of direct criticism. If you look at DIA figures and Gulf figures, we're spending at least five to seven times, I shouldn't say we, the Gulf Arab states, less Iraq, are paying five to seven times as much for military forces using DIA and IISS elements as Iran. Well over 15 times the arms imports. That should buy far more military effectiveness, but there is no Gulf country in the Arab side that is developing effective interoperability with any other Gulf country. And when it comes down to coordinating any kind 
a broad military operation. Multi-domain operations, hybrid operations, any kind of missile defense or air attack has to be coordinated with the United States. It's not simply this foolish sort of game of thrones. You've largely isolated Oman and you have Kuwait postured essentially for American reentry and fast deployment of forces caught between Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia, which does not plan effective deployments to come to Kuwait's aid. This is not how we can develop effective cooperation and coordination. You need realistic assessments of the threat, realistic, realistic assessments of how to cooperate. Strategies have to be defined in terms of tangible force plans, real programs, and real budgets. The extent to which think tanks and analysts of this region don't seem to be able to pronounce the word budget and never review any of the details of arms imports, how they actually can operate, and the force structures is a frightening indication of the lack of analysis and planning that's needed in a region that now faces, as we've seen, precision strike capabilities that can hit at any fixed target from Iran, as well as a vastly superior Iranian capability to conduct hybrid warfare inside the Gulf. Those Iranian capabilities will continue to improve, just as Iran's capabilities have improved in terms of cooperation and expansion and outside the region. And if we look at Iran, what have we gotten out of maximum pressure? It hasn't inhibited the military development of Iran so far. It certainly hasn't halted the nuclear weapons effort. You might want to look at yesterday's news on a new nuclear research facility in Iran. It hasn't affected the political situation. If anything, the legislature is now far more restrictive and far more loyal to the leadership, far more connected to the Revolutionary Guards. And does anyone really believe there's going to be a more moderate president when the presidential election comes? If we have done anything, it seems to be a somewhat vain hope that if we put enough pressure in civil terms on Iran, we will end up with regime collapse. Well, let me just close by pointing out. So far, regime collapse hasn't worked out too well since 2012. It hasn't exactly solved the problems of Libya, Syria, Iraq, or Yemen. And the warning I would give is when you really force collapse of a regime of 80 million people, you might want to consider what happens next. So believe me, I am heartily in favor of reassuring slogans, references to the international community, talks of Arab alliances that casually ignore the last 50 years of inability to create an effective alliance in security. But these are the real world problems we have to live with. Thank you, Dr. Goldsman. Uh, thought provoking, uh, for sure. It's, uh, it is a complicated uh, world between politics and, uh, and, and, and defense uh, and also geography. Uh, this, I will uh, uh, now introduce our uh, fourth uh, speaker commentator, Mr. Josh Yappi. Yappi, sorry. <laughs> Josh is a, is a, is a scholar in residence at the National Council. 
U.S. Arab uh, relations, and also he is the Arabian Peninsula analyst at the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Intelligence and Research. Welcome, Josh. And so I also welcome you, Josh. Uh, well, I welcome your uh, analysis and comments on what you've uh, heard thus far from uh, from us, our speakers. So, um, uh, without any further ado, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Abbas. I really appreciate it, and it's a real honor to be here. These are fantastic speakers, uh, Kirsten, Chinzia, Tony. It's a real honor to be able to share the stage with you, and I'm I'm really glad that you let me be here. Uh, I don't have prepared remarks because I was invited here as a respondent to be able to comment on the other presentations. Uh, so I apologize if it's a little bit disjointed, but let's uh, let's start with where we left off. Um, uh, Tony gave a very a very uh, uh, dire prognosis. Um, and, and I respect that and I respect his learning. I think that a lot of what Tony is saying, uh, this idea that the, the planning and analysis that's going on in the region is inadequate to match current procurement with long-term threats and threat perceptions uh, and accounting for the need for collaboration, cooperation in the United States. I think a lot of Tony's analysis and, and planning is predicated on, on two things, uh, which I would question. Number one, if you're a planner in the Gulf and, and you believe in that line of thinking, then it means that you believe that a conventional war in the Gulf or something approximating it is a real possibility. Uh, something of a large scale, it doesn't need to be an all out war, it doesn't need to be a, a, a total uh, war, but it could be something of a, a, a lesser scale and yet involving conventional forces that therefore need preparation and, and countering from the side of the Arab Gulf states. That would be the first assumption. The second assumption is that if you're a planner in the Gulf and you're you're trying to organize your force uh, projection around these these uh, definitions, these uh, uh, delimitations, then uh, number two, you have to believe that the U.S. is going to support you in the event of that conventional war. Uh, those are the two two assumptions that that planning is based on. I don't know planners in the Gulf from the last 10, 15 years that that operate under those assumptions. Uh, certainly those that was the case during Gulf War I and its aftermath, uh, depending on how you define Gulf War I, the Iran-Iraq War and then, and then the, the 1990-1991 war. Uh, you were talking large scale mobilization of forces with US direct involvement with, with political will. So I think that uh, uh, there, there is a level of, of importance to everything that Dr. Korsman is saying and a critical aspect to it. And I don't disagree with any of it. I'm simply asking whether there isn't a different set of priorities and a different set of uh, uh, threat perceptions that go on in the Gulf that guides some of this planning that leads many of these governments to minimize or downplay the need for advanced conventional land forces or conventional naval forces. There's also a number of cultural factors. Uh, navies in the Gulf are, are not looked upon as the best career for your sons to go into uh, in terms of honor and prestige of the family. And that's been the case for quite a while. But, but putting aside cultural factors and focusing strictly on, on defense and security threats and perceptions and, and procurements, um, I think that that a lot of procurement goes on for the sake of signaling to rivals, both enemies and friendly rivals, that you have capable forces and, and therefore collaboration, cooperation and other spheres of bilateral and multilateral activity are important, that you're a country that is needed to be respected. In that regard, I don't, I don't know that necessarily matters that the UAE doesn't fully 100% coordinate its, its uh, force projection and its procurement needs um, with its GCC neighbors in every single aspect, the UAE has proven that it's capable of leading and organizing military action in the region uh, on its own, um, not entirely on its own. There's always uh, involvement of Western partners, including the United States, but, but to an extent that it doesn't need permission necessarily from its neighbors in order to engage in uh, uh, unilateral or multilateral action. Um, and that is a successful policy outcome, even if it doesn't lead to, even if it only leads to presidential guard 
mobilization, maintenance, advancement, and not necessarily to the direct deployment of some of the other conventional forces that would allow them to expand and grow and and uh, build their relationships with their their conventional forces of their Gulf allies. Um, that being said, uh, let's go back to the idea of Gulf security architectures. This is a topic that Kirsten raised. It's something implicit in what Chinzi is talking about in terms of European uh, allies looking for how the US is going to engage and fearing an over-reliance on the United States. And it's, it's something that uh, Dr. Cordesman definitely alludes to and, and mentions towards the end of his remarks. Um, we've engaged in Gulf security architectures for the last 20 years and more. Uh, what Abbas is talking about with the Carter Doctrine, uh, we had a number of negotiations with different Gulf allies uh, circa 1980, starting with Oman, and, and a lot of that was involved in trying to rescue the hostages from Iran, that we needed certain uh, landing spaces that could uh, accommodate our uh, rescue mission and uh, the basing requirements required a whole new set of, of negotiations that were involved in it. And in theory, in line with the Carter Doctrine, we would have been engaged in uh, uh, strategic uh, dialogue, strategic um, uh, partnerships uh, that may have led to some sort of security umbrellas, not a nuclear umbrella, of course, but uh, of a certain lesser nature. Uh, I talked to a number of our ambassadors that were in the Gulf in the early 80s to try and find out how far those, those discussions had advanced. But everyone seems to indicate that, that uh, they didn't result in, uh, in any actual outcomes as might have been envisioned at the beginning of that process, except for the basing agreements in Oman, which did allow us to do the Eagle One operation. The, the types of security architectures that I'm familiar with, I'm much more familiar with from the 2000s and the early 2010s, you're talking about the Gulf Security Dialogue. You're talking about the Security Cooperation Forum, which came out, came out of the, the Camp David meetings. Uh, and you're talking, of course, about MISA, which Kirsten was directly involved in, uh, the Middle East Strategic Alliance. There are a number of other side lights that, that were uh, components or add-ons or um, uh, overlapping with the, these things. There was the GCC plus two, meaning Egypt and Jordan, which was very prominent uh, uh, in the late 2000s. Um, uh, there was Iraq and its neighbors, which was a form in the mid 2000s. There were a number of other, of, of other collaborative initiatives that fed into these uh, security architectures. And of course, a security architecture isn't just a talking form. A security architecture, as Joe McMillan used to write about years ago, is, is a whole range of security options and security uh, engagements. Even basing our forces in another country is part of a security architecture inherently because it's a commitment of resources and, and uh, money. Um, and that it, it contributes to an overall policy objective, which is security in the region. So when we talk about security architectures, we have to think broadly, but just focusing for a minute on, on actual forums, uh, initiatives, the type that, that uh, Kirsten raised and that uh, uh, Dr. Cordesman uh, referred to, it, it seems to me that, that there are certain guidelines that, that we have to keep in mind. Um, and every new administration comes in with an idea for a security architecture. So I suppose this is timely to some extent, but it, it seems to me that, that one of the, the key principal uh, uh, fundamental uh, recommendations that, that anyone can make is that the agenda has to be specific enough that it doesn't open up discussions to a free-for-all. And that's the type of free-for-all that Kirsten was describing where certain nations wanted to focus solely on security and that shut down a broader conversation about energy and economics, et cetera. Uh, so I would, I would say that the agenda has to be specific enough that it doesn't open up to a free-for-all, the discussion, uh, because every participating nation has their own national interests. Every participating nation has its own domestic constraints. Okay, political constraints. And every participating nation has its own interpretations of the language that's being used in that forum. And if you set down a very broad topic agenda, as most of these forums have done with multiple pillars, um, uh, then you're opening up that conversation to a lengthy and weighty debate about how we define these things. And the participating nations aren't interested in academic debate about how to define these things. They're interested in defining these, these topics, these outcomes, these out, outputs in terms that appeal to their domestic audience and signal to their regional rivals and their regional neighbors their strength or, and hiding their weakness. 
Uh, and the same thing goes for the host nations, for the sponsors, the Europeans or the Americans, the British, whatever it may be. Yeah. They too, when they lay down definitions uh, um, and they, they, they do not make them specific enough, uh, yes, it facilitates greater buy-in at the, at the beginning. It allows more people to come to the table, but once at the table, it creates more debate and discussion among those European, American, uh, British allies mm -hmm. Uh, who have their own interests in uh, having a, a stake in the in the in the pie, and how to uh, shape that agenda as it moves forward. Um, uh, and I, I'd like to refer in all of this to how the Arab-Israeli multilateral process was run in the 1990s, because there, yes, they had uh, multiple baskets of of issues, and they they had broad participation. But the way they were able to delimit uh, those agendas and keep the conversations relatively focused and they weren't entirely focused and they broke apart for a number of reasons. But one of the ways they were able to do that was by focusing from the beginning on confidence building measures, uh, not on broad, uh, broad uh, shaping operations for how the region should look. So by talking about search and rescue or um, uh, earthquake monitoring, which had a side purpose of nuclear monitoring, uh, by focusing on these tangible uh, confidence building measures, you could allow the participants to explore the discussion in whatever way they felt necessary. So that if Israel uh, or Egypt or other countries could not agree on certain things like weapons of mass destruction free zone, you could break that out into another group and allow them to continue discussing it while you continued to make progress on specific confidence building measures. So allowing the CBMs to define the agenda actually in a way allowed the agenda itself to breathe. By the same token, we talk about membership, we talk about participation, uh, uh, we talk about Turkey, Iran, Syria, countries that don't fit neatly into the security calculus, who uh, some Western nations would, would want to exclude, or at least marginalize, perhaps, and even some regional partners would want to exclude in theory, though maybe uh, have a difficult time doing for the public messaging sake. Um, by creating a membership structure or a, a, a process that allows the, the participants to breathe so that you can have uh, uh, formalized sessions on a periodic basis with a strict membership, but then you can have off-session working groups in which uh, non-members or non-parties to the forum are allowed to come in and come out uh, on a subsidiary basis. Uh, that creates creates the possibility that over time these people can be incorporated on a more substantive level. Uh, we could also talk about timing and, and how you... That's, that's good. That's good, Josh. Thank you. That's very, very good. Very comprehensive. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Abbas. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Josh. That's uh, uh, a lot of uh, lot to digest here. Very, uh, like I said, very comprehensive and uh, you brought, on, uh, brought in a lot of details. Um, unfortunately, we have a larger issue to, uh, to really discuss before we go down to uh, a lot of details. And we talked about a lot of topics here. I mean, uh, um, Mesa is a good topic. I thought maybe we can uh, uh, go back and talk about it a little bit, Yemen as well. But let me, uh, on, on Mesa, I thought, because I was also um, pretty much close to it back in Riyadh when, uh, when the idea started in 2016, um, you know, 17. And I know from the Gulf perspective, the uh, Gulf country, especially Saudi Arabia, was very interested in getting this going. Um, so it's unfortunate to see that now this is going to a, a new uh, a new vision of that. Uh, I don't know the details of it, but I wonder if, uh, if Kirsten, could you, uh, uh, what, what do you think of the, the new vision and the new uh, Mesa 2 uh, would look like from uh, from a Biden perspective? And, well, Abbas, we haven't seen a, a vision for a MESA 2 from the Biden team itself. Um, you know, they'd be more than welcome to review anything that was done on MESA because it really was a bipartisan um, idea at the time. As everyone has mentioned, this wasn't the first attempt. You know, this has been tried over and over again. What we thought at the time was that it was critical because we were at an inflection point with our relationship with the region. And, um, and in terms of securing some of U.S. influence on our side and securing U.S. presence on the Gulf side, it was, it was time. Um, and, and it needed to be prioritized. So originally it was conceived as an alliance among the Gulf nations plus Egypt and Jordan to serve as a platform for creating a block of military capability and stability that would outweigh that of any individual country. 
And it had the economic security and energy pillars underpinned by a governance structure with the logic that you can't have stability without security in a functioning economy. Um, and you know, with the economies of the region being based on energy for the foreseeable future, that was the, the, the logic for including but due to the pressure from some of the Gulf countries that who were looking for a security only um, you know, agreement with even pushing at some point for a NATO Article 5 like security clause that was completely out of the question on the US side, um, the, the concept got narrowed. But the White House at the time, the NSC um, senior director and then the director who was a military, you know, uniform military officer detailed from the Department of Defense who worked on this for 18 months as his full time job. Um, tried to pull in the, what we got from this renewed request in the region to create this kind of a larger security um, agreement that still had in it a lot of the concepts we were looking for. So what it included at the time that it was that the renewed proposal went before the U.S. administration was capability development centers in the region that would own a vertical for a particular field of capability like maritime security, like cyber, like missile defense, and as a training hub and kind of an archive of capability for the whole region. It included a counterterrorism strategic framework that would codify responsibilities for member states, the National Counterterrorism Center and the US uh, wrote the draft for that. Um, it included intelligence sharing arrangements. It included a strategic plans development platform that was kind of, as I mentioned, modeled a little bit on the idea of the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, which is the world's largest security oriented intergovernmental organization. It wasn't going to be exactly like that. But the point was, let's include the same kind of function under MESA. Um, and I, I, I won't go into more on that, but you know, if anybody's interested, we can certainly do. And it included a civilian security coordination umbrella for things like police and border security, aviation, customs, immigration, and then a humanitarian aid and development coordination umbrella under which the aid agencies of all members would draft single strategies for each recipient country and pursue those objectives in tandem and then a pandemic um, task force that of course was added later on. So it's supposed to be a platform for addressing threats of many natures from regional adversaries to radical ideologies, failing state coups, pandemics. It was envisioned as a mechanism, not a military and it was by definition defensive, not offensive. So that was the latest iteration of this vision that was worked out by the region and by the National Security Council at the time before the uh, deputies committee at the White House said, this is not what we agreed to. Where is the economic and energy piece? Um, we, aren't, we aren't on board with this. And that's when the White House said, all right, region, we've done what we can for you. We've done everything we could. Um, our government is no longer behind this concept. Um, and so it, it stopped being a discussion, but we keep hearing it raised uh, by, by de Democratic congressmen. We hear it raised by some of Biden's advisors. We hear it raised in the EU. Yeah. We hear it raised in the UN, not MESA specifically, but the need for a similar, some kind of regional mechanism um, to, to manage security architecture. Very good, very good. Thank you. Very, well, that's insightful as well. I have a question for whoever wants to uh, answer it on, on Yemen. I know Yemen keeps coming up and it uh, seems like the, uh, uh, the Biden administration will have to do something uh, uh, related uh, uh, on, on that front. Uh, but uh, we all know that it's uh, while the, uh, the uh, Air Coalition uh, prosecuting their, uh, their operations uh, in Yemen, um, against the Houthis, uh, United States have uh, also a footprint in Yemen doing uh, counterterrorism. So how is how can you know we kind of peel off from Yemen, uh, not assisting the coalition, and peel off away from Yemen while we're still uh, prosecuting a counterterrorism uh, operation in there? Anybody cares to comment on that? Okay. Uh how do we flag it? Uh, Dr. Grossman, you said you want to comment on that? I think it's a good question, but the US strikes were essentially focused on relatively limited elements of terrorist groups. You got to the point where those groups had proliferated. We now have some 28 hostile factions somewhere in Yemen. Some of them are very small. Some of them are obviously much more significant. If you look at the targeting capabilities the US had, you've lost some of the elements of those targeting capabilities because you can't embed or rely on a functioning government there. I think we have had the odd strike, but do we really need to withdraw 
I think you hit on a key point, and it'll be interesting to see how the Biden administration deals with this. Because these aren't long wars involving major US assets. They're carefully focused interventions against key targets and terrorist elements. And I think the honest answer to your question is, you shouldn't make categorical statements about withdrawal and you shouldn't define things too precisely when you may need to go back and you may need to intervene against a key target. I would hope that perhaps on the 21st of January, you might reconsider some of these issues. Thank you. Yes, I, it is. I mean, uh, it is um, it is a considerable uh, footprint over Yemen uh, prosecuting the counterterrorism. And uh, as I'm away from the, uh, from the government, but uh, uh, the, our intelligence, um, U.S. intelligence services, uh, either agencies, they still uh, see a threat, uh, a counterterrorism uh, threat uh, in Yemen. So I, I, uh, I venture to say it's not about to uh, move away any anytime soon. And and by the way, the uh, the airspace over Yemen is owned by uh, basically controlled by by the Saudi uh, military at this point. So we have to do some coordination uh, with them on daily basis on on, on this uh, CT mission. Boss, as you know, the you know the, the CT mission in in Yemen predates the 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 war there and predates the coalition predates the the effort to to remove the Houthi opposition government from Sana'a. So um, the, the CT mission is also handled in entirely different departments of the US military and intelligence community. And um, Josh may wanna weigh in on this as well, but I don't see any indication that the Biden administration will curtail the, the specific CT mission or CT operations or the CT coordination that we do predominantly with the UAE in Yemen. I think that will continue. Yeah, I just add to what Kirsten said. I think that, um, and, and what Tony said, there will always be a way to do counterterrorism in Yemen because you will always find a partner on the other side who thinks that there is money and training available to him that will benefit him and his patronage network. So, so you will always find someone willing to stand up on the Yemeni side saying, I'm in charge of a legitimate government. I will give you legal permissions to do the counterterrorism that you want to do. Just work with me and make sure that whatever training and money that you're giving comes to me and my network. Um, and you will always be able then to be able to paper over uh, uh, your your uh, justification, your legitimacy for doing counterterrorism in Yemen, even in the absence of broader coalitions. Uh, thank thank you. Uh, one one observation uh, on uh, on uh, cooperation or dialogues. Uh, as you know, in the last last year, or so we have a series of strategic dialogues, uh, mainly with the Gulf. Uh, you know, we had one with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. And I think about to have one with the Kuwait. We had one with uh, with uh, with Iraq, and it seems that the, there's a lot to talk at the strategic level, but uh, not much going on at the uh, at the military level. But I would like to uh, uh, have uh, 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 Dr. Bianco, if you at, at the strategic level in there, uh, have you have you seen any uh, dialogues going on at like I said at that level from from a European perspective with the with the uh, with the region? It doesn't have to be Gulf, you know, maybe somewhere in North Africa. If, if you care to comment on that, please. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, your question actually uh, provides an opportunity to talk about the relationship between, between France and the UAE, which is, I think, an interesting mm -hmm. case that has seen a lot of development, including some limited um, strategic coordination, if you want to call it strategic, in the sense that it's mostly uh, aligning uh, um, already similar geopolitical interests, in particular in, in Africa, in Libya, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa, and trying to see where there is the, the convergence and trying to uh, uh, work on that coordination. That's, that's a relatively new phenomenon, because as I was describing before, um, save from the United Kingdom, there was no other European country that really had interest or uh, opportunity to develop a um, something resembling a strategic relationship with uh, any of the GCC monarchies in particular. Um, so this is still, we're still in testing territory basically, but what we're seeing is uh, um, rather interesting, I think, for the purpose of uh, sketching out what we could see in the future. Uh, there is certainly um, some broad, broadly speaking convergence on seeing Islamism and political Islam as 
a formidable threat um, that can you know morph and and can go from the region uh, from North Africa to uh, other uh, shores including in Europe uh, where of course as you would know there is a very large diaspora uh, coming from the Mediterranean countries uh, the southern Mediterranean countries and to even to the Gulf from uh, a UAE perspective. However, I think it's interesting to uh, look at how this partnership is being structured. It seems to me that it's the first sort of partnership uh, blueprint, one of the very first blueprint of partnerships in an era of something we could call retrenchment of global powers. Um, and France, I mean, as a, as a large regional power makes no exception in the sense that they are doubling down on their engagement in the region, but still have uh, a number of question marks and limits. And so the way in which they cooperate with the UAE so suggests um, that maybe we could see in the future a co-partnership, co-pilot uh, modality of, of engagement, which opens up, I think, a number of possibilities, for instance, on something like cooperative bilateralism. Uh, bilateralism and multilateralism do not have to be at all costs uh, against one another. One can use uh, privileged bilateral channels to reinforce multilateral messages, especially in a place and in a region like the, like the Middle East and the Gulf, where threat perceptions are so different from one country to another. And we know not even the UAE and Saudi Arabia have identical threat perception. So um, I think there is, a, there is some, something to think about here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, you're right about the uh, the uh, uh, bilateral engagement versus the multilateral engagements. And uh, and um, I remember uh, even back then, when uh, under Obama administration, when uh, uh, Secretary Chuck Hagel landed in Riyadh um, back in 2014, the message there at that time when they did the uh, uh, defense ministerial is to uh, to that the United States is no longer doing uh, bilateral engagements. We must move into multilateral engagements with, and that uh, and the burden sharing and so on. But uh, and uh, we're not we're not uh, uh, there yet. So um, uh, for the uh, uh, sake uh, of time, I think we have about uh, 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 ten minutes. Uh, we can. Uh, I'm gonna. You know, each of you, if you like, you can have a, 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 a uh, one minute or two minute uh, closing uh, comments uh, before we uh, pass on to the next uh, next event. But one thing uh, uh, we mentioned on the counterterrorism, and uh, that's what the General McKinsey talks about. This is a big mission about the counter ideology and uh, and uh, and uh, how we counter uh, uh, counter um, extremism writ large. Uh, one thing we know in the in the in the Arab world, we have a youth bulge and those youth are the source uh, the source for stability and uh, source for instability and and the region have for the, for the longest time you know uh, the, the the youth are remain still today you know susceptible to indoctrina for indoctrinations and recruitment I mean you see you see right now uh, also child soldiers you see all these child uh, soldiers and Houthis uh, Yemenis include uh, kind of recruited and indoctrinated to join the, uh, the Houthi uh, movement you see the Syrian uh, refugees and Syrians uh, you know recruited by the by the Turks to uh, to uh, to fight in, in Libya and or uh, Nukora Kabara uh, you see about uh, you know ISIS recruiting from the Sunnis you see how the Iranian regime recruiting the Shiite Arabs to fight for them whether in uh, in Iraq or uh, or in uh, in Lebanon, so they're perhaps not sure how would uh, you know one day we could move this uh, government to government uh, 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 transactions of articles of uh, defense, articles and services defense to include uh, this this uh, uh, this uh, human uh, dimension to, in, into the defense cooperation uh, uh, construct. Uh, on that, I would uh, I would. Uh, 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 I guess we keep the same order of uh, we started. I'll take, I'll take uh, the, uh, give the floor to uh, Kirsten to uh, uh, just uh, uh, give us uh, her uh, final remarks. Well, about one minute, please. Abbas, I'll stick on on your topic and reassure folks that in the coming four years we're going to see a renewed emphasis on things like addressing that youth bulge. Um, it wasn't front and center, but during the last four years, a lot of USAID and US public diplomacy funding was spent on addressing things like that and creating 
um, opportunities for this youth bulge you're talking about. I heard a former US official state recently that the region is going to need to create 60 million jobs over the coming years. And from a national security perspective, the reason that's meaningful is because if you don't create jobs, you know, they're um, they are more vulnerable to the temptations of radicalization. So you will see a return, I believe, under a Biden administration to an emphasis on things like countering violent extremism. And you'll see additional funding and resources going to programs within USAID that are intended to create opportunities for this youth bulge, link them with, um, with opportunities around the world, and from a national security perspective, again, to preventing them from being recruited by what we're seeing as a resurgence in radical ideologies using things like COVID um, and populism as narratives. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Bianco? Thank you very much. I will just, uh, I will borrow uh, one sentence from my good friend and uh, wonderful colleague, Dr. Abdallah Baboud, who and I know was uh, among the speakers of uh, this brilliant conference. And he's saying often uh, a very, I think, important phrase lately, that these are extraordinary times where we shouldn't only be trying to think outside the box, but we should try to scrap the box completely. And I think it's a, it's a re really useful sentence. And thank you very much to Abbas and the uh, National Council and all of my panelists. Thank you too, Dr. Bianca, for joining us. Um, uh, Dr. Gorsman, floor is yours. I think it's really hard to sum up anything in a minute or two, but I'd make two points. One, the whole purpose of multi domain warfare is to create the capability to deal with the whole spectrum of conflict. And I would hope the State Department might want to read some of the recent literature from the Joint Chiefs and actually examine what we're buying and why we're buying it. Because the Gulf countries alone are going to have spent $100 billion this year on military forces. A vast amount of that will be arms sales, and these are not toys and they come at the expense of civil development. And it is time to take a really hard look at what is happening, not call for more meetings, generalities, or good intentions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bozeman. Um, uh, Josh, do you have any final thoughts on comments? Yeah, a lot of the discussion the last few weeks I've noticed has been uh, trying to figure out how do we resolve the current conflicts that exist in the region, uh, and then and then talking around broader regional problems in terms that might go back to four years ago, eight years ago, twelve years ago. But I think that a lot of this misses how the region's changed, and, and it's it's significantly different than it was four years ago, eight years or ten years ago. Uh, and one of those things is that you've got millions of refugees living abroad who can't go home. Uh, you have uh, 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 divisions within the Gulf that even if they get resolved on paper, there's so much ill will that's been built up over the last three years that it's going to be hard to resolve them in practice or in reality. And, uh, and you have uh, an Iranian regime that uh, has, isn't going to go straight back to where it was four years ago or eight years ago. It'll have its own demands based on what its perceptions are of, of progress other countries are making in the region. So I think that those debates aren't being had right now. And they're going to have to be had at some point in the near future. Thank you, thank you, Josh. Uh, yeah, correct. I mean, uh, after after all, um, uh, defense uh, uh, defense cooperation is a political tool, and uh, we need uh, uh, we need our diplomats and also we need the policymakers to uh, get together and uh, aim for uh, better politics. And uh, on that note, uh, I uh, thank my uh, all my uh, panelists, speakers. Uh, have done a, a superb job, uh, very insightful, uh, fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, so on, uh, uh, I thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Council, I uh, thank you again for uh, joining us. Uh, uh, thank you, and have a good day, everyone. Uh, Colonel Abbas, uh, thank you for your role in moderating, chairing this session. Speaking with uh, each of the participants as resource specialists, because when you have people who are focusing on the same region for their professional uh, time, energies, and creativity, the likelihood of their duplicating or repeating or overlapping with one another is great. 
unless someone choreographs uh, the, the priorities uh, in terms of the speakers, uh, what they will emphasize, what they will focus on, what they will not address and leave to someone else to do. So we, we thank you immensely, um, uh, Abbas, for this. And it was nice to know from Cynthia Bianco, her relationship with Abdullah Babu. And uh, she and I met him at the same place, same way, at the Gulf Research Center's annual uh, Gulf Research meetings in uh, Cambridge. Uh, this is something that once the pandemic is over, uh, one can only hope that a growing number of Americans will participate in it. Uh, there are around three to 400 who participate annually. I have from the beginning. And it's been uh, shocking and embarrassing to realize that of the 400, only a dozen uh, at most Americans are participating in these sessions. And the reason has to do with the GCC countries in the 80s wanting to have a special uh, cooperative uh, agreement accord relationship with the United States, like it was exploring with the European Union. Uh, but there were no takers on the uh, American side. And so uh, plan B on the GCC side was then to punt uh, in the direction of uh, the European Union. And so one of the easiest and earliest projects was for all of those in the GCC working on matters pertaining to the European Union uh, have the names, spellings, communications, uh, coordinates of, of all of these individuals and vice versa. Those in the EU then at 13 countries then uh, to 27 countries had the same uh, list of uh, acquaintances, fellow scholars and researchers and writers and publicists uh, in the GCC region. The US missed the boat on this and uh, there's nowhere near the degree of usness uh, that needs to be brought into being uh, between the United States and the uh, Arab policymakers such as the European Union has uh, achieved and accomplished and kudos to them for doing this. Not, never too late in these uh, fields to play catch up ball and to do the right thing or try to do the right thing at the right time for the right reasons, the right people and inshallah the right results. Uh, so thank you for your role as a moderator chairman of this session, uh, Colonel 